Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. We pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. We'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services, whether in live worship online at court.org slash live or in person at one of our locations in the Kansas City area. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about our service times and ministries, please visit Cora.org. We hope you enjoy this message. Over the last month, our congregation has been looking at the Christmas story as found in Matthew and Luke's gospel through the lens of, or with the help of, classic Hollywood Christmas movies. And with each of those movies, we've looked at the stories and we've seen how they illustrate ideas that are found in the Christmas story in the gospels. Today, as we conclude that series on Christmas Eve, we're gonna focus on A Christmas Carol. Now, of course, this was a novella written by Charles Dickens in 1843. And the novella, like so much of his writing, was based in part on his own story. So Charles Dickens, at the age of 12, his father was arrested for not being able to pay off his debts. And so he went to debtor's prison and then he would work off part of his debt and someone could possibly pay off his debt and redeem him or set him free in that way. And that's exactly what happens with with Charles Dickens' father. Anyway, Charles Dickens, at the age of 12, had to drop out of school and go to work full-time in order to support his family. And he ends up working in a a, uh, shoe shine uh, factory. They made shoe shine, shoe polish, and uh, and he put the labels on the on the canisters that they that they were you know that held the black polish. And as he did this, he was working ten hour days, six days a week. So here's a twelve year old kid dropping out of school to provide for his family, working sixty hours a week. Hard to imagine that, but that was life for many people in that time. And often in Charles Dickens' writings, we see a particular concern for the poor for kids who had to work, you know, 60 hours a week, for a society that, that didn't always treat people, uh, well, most often didn't treat people with equality, with kindness, with justice. And so this becomes a theme of his novellas this is, and his novels. This, this was true for, uh, for A Christmas Carol. Anyway, A Christmas Carol is known uh, around the world. It is probably the best known Christmas story aside from the true Christmas story as found in the Gospels. It's been made into movies, into television shows, uh, ballets, operas, and much more. Over 100 adaptations of the story uh, that have been brought to the stage or brought to the, brought to the screen. And today we're going to look at several of those uh, clips from several of those different adaptations as we are telling the story of A Christmas Carol and then looking at the true story of Christmas as found in the Gospels. So as we begin, I want to remind you the protagonist is, is a man named Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. And Dickens was really intentional about the names he gave to his characters. So let me just unpack the name first, and that's going to help us with the rest of the sermon. So Ebenezer is a Hebrew word, and it means stone of help. And uh, we find it three times in the Bible, and all of them in First or Second Samuel, I don't remember which. And Samuel himself, the prophet, after the Israelites had been delivered from the, from the Philistines, he puts up a stone in the middle of a field, a big stone, and he, and he calls it his Ebenezer. It is a stone of help. It's a reminder that God had delivered his people. And so every time they saw that rock, they were to remember, God helped us in the past. Surely God can help us in the future. Or they would stop and rejoice and give thanks for the freedom that they had. And, and when a child was given the name Ebenezer, it meant the parents hoped that that child would be a sign that God helps that God cares. And more than that, that that child would himself by his actions be one who demonstrates care and concern and help for other people in the name of God. And so this child in Dickens' novella was named Ebenezer. That's a really good sign and a good name. But then there was Scrooge. Now Scrooge comes from an old English, kind of archaic name uh, or word, uh, English word, screws. And screws meant to uh, put pressure on something to, in fact, if you think of screwing something together, it's putting pressure on something. It it can be, uh, actually it can be causing harm to something. It it reflects um, this idea of of squashing something. And so he is Ebenezer, the stone of help, and he's Scrooge from screws, which means you apply pressure. You actually end up squashing something or someone. And so you can see from the start that his names really have a conflicting nature to them. And that points to the conflict we see in the story of uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, who started out as a good young man. And along the way, he gets off track. He gets off the path. 
And then the story is about bringing him back on the right path. This is a redemption story. And it's a story that ties in with the very essence of the Christian faith. All right, so I wanna begin by meeting Mr. Scrooge. And we're gonna do that by seeing a, you know, a picture of his soul uh, in his office. And the clip that I'm gonna share with you here is from a Christmas carol, a Muppet Christmas carol. Michael Caine is Ebenezer Scrooge. Take a look. A Merry Christmas, Uncle Scrooge. God save you. Merry Christmas. Ah. Humbug. Quick, it'll be warmer in there. <laughs> Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Oh, you don't mean that, surely. Ooh, actually, I think it's colder in here. Mm. Merry Christmas, you say. What right of you to be merry? You're poor enough. What right of you to be dismal? You're rich enough. He's got him there, the old boy's speechless. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be cooked with his own turkey mm. and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Ooh. Well, not quite speechless. Mm. Oh, Uncle. Nephew. You keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Christmas is a loving, honest and charitable time. And though it's never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that Christmas has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. And how does one celebrate Christmas on the unemployment line? Scrooge is a caricature of a self-absorbed human being narcissistic, self-centered, somebody who's unkind, uncharitable, irritable, frustrating. And at his worst, he's someone who doesn't really care. He's apathetic and indifferent to the suffering of other people. I'm reminded of Ellie Wassell's famous words, the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. And here's the bad news. There's a little bit of Scrooge inside of every one of us. Inside of you and inside of me, there is something of Scrooge inside of us where we find ourselves irritable. We find ourselves frustrating that people demand something or want something of us. We find ourselves not wanting to help, not wanting to be concerned. We find ourselves apathetic and indifferent. There are times we are very frustrating to be around and we can seem quite narcissistic or self-absorbed. We don't wanna be that, but that is a part of what lives inside of us. That's part of the human condition. And so the story of Christmas, the birth of Jesus is a redemption story. It's about a redeemer who came, one who came to save us, to rescue us, to deliver us. And in this particular case, a Christmas carol is the story of the redemption of one human being who struggles with the human condition, Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, a Christmas carol goes on. It, it, it does its work of helping us understand the human condition, understand the Christmas story and Ebenezer Scrooge by telling of a Christmas Eve long ago when Ebenezer Scrooge was, was uh, met with three ghosts of Christmas. So there's a ghost of Christmas past, a ghost of Christmas present, and a ghost of Christmas future. And each of these are gonna be a part of their goal is to work on Ebenezer Scrooge until he finally repents, until he finally has a change of mind and a change of heart that leads to a change of behavior and he becomes the person he was always meant to be. So the ghost of Christmas past approaches Ebenezer Scrooge at night on Christmas Eve and he takes him back to the past to help him understand what happened to him. So we find Ebenezer Scrooge is a small boy or as a young man, he's at school and his father doesn't want him to come home. His father has rejected him. And we recognize that a young person doesn't become a Scrooge without pain, without disappointment, without heartache, without rejection. And this is exactly what's happened to Ebenezer Scrooge. We, we move beyond that, that sense of rejection to the loss of his beloved sister. And in her death, there was something else happened and disappointment and pain and brokenness and grief. We find our hearts are either moved towards God or they move away from God. And for Ebenezer Scrooge, he moved just a little bit further away from the path, away from being Ebenezer and towards being Scrooge. And we find that there was, a, there was a, a businessman who worked with Ebenezer Scrooge as a young man and he was mentoring him and, and he gave him the impression that the most important thing in life was to have money, especially when you came out of poverty. And he was determined he would never be poor again. And so money became the driving force in his life and his career and his ambition and all of this became the driving force. He was engaged to be married. But after a few years of this, his, uh, his betrothed, Belle, said she'd had enough. And she, she told him that he was free to break off the engagement. I want you to see the scene of this. It's a really powerful scene. It comes from the 1999 version of A Christmas Carol with Patrick Stewart as Ebenezer Scrooge. And the ghost of Christmas past takes Ebenezer, the aged man, back in time to when he was a young man and the conversation that happened with Belle. Take a look. All your nobler hopes have merged into the one hope of being rich. One master passion engulfs you. Money. What of it? Even if I've grown wiser, I've not changed towards you, have I? Our promise to marry is an old one. 
It was made when we were poor and content to be so until we improved our fortunes. You are changed. When we promised each other, you were another man. I was a boy. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. But I have thought of it and can release you from your promise. No, no. Have I ever asked you to release me? In words, no, never. How then? In your changed nature, in everything that made me love you. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? such a painful scene and Ebenezer Scrooge, the older Ebenezer Scrooge looks back and you can see the grief. He cries out, no. And then after this, he says, go get her, go, go tell her, you know, you want her, but no, he's, he's unable to do that as a young man. And what might've been a very happy life with children is lost because of his love for money and his focus on acquisitions and, and power and possessions. I'm reminded of Jesus who said, our life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions, but Ebenezer Scrooge has already lost sight of that as he's growing up. And so instead he has a life of loneliness and pain. I remember some years ago, a woman here at Church of the Resurrection came to see me and she wanted to tell me about her husband. And she said, Adam, I don't know what's happened, but over the last few years, my husband has changed. He's changed and not for the better. He, he used to be so loving. He was such a great father. He cared for us and he doesn't do that anymore. He seems focused on, on acquisition and on growing and his company and, and climbing the corporate ladder. And, and I just want my husband back. And ultimately they divorced. They, they were not able to survive a husband who had forgotten what was important in his life and focused on what really didn't matter in the end. This is Ebenezer Scrooge's story. And the point of, these, of this story and of these ghosts from Christmas past, present and future is to help him see the light. And he begins to see that as he sees Bell canceling the engagement and leaving and him by himself for decades later. Now, listen, we're all changing over time. You change, I change. There's nothing wrong with changing. The key is, are you changing in a good way or a bad way over time? And this is a question we all have to ask. When we as Christians are changing in a positive way, we call it sanctification. It's a process the Holy Spirit works in us in which we are becoming more holy, more like Jesus. We're becoming the people we were meant to be. But that doesn't always happen in our lives. So I wanna ask you, are you changing in a good way or a bad way? Would your family or your friends or your coworkers or your spouse, if you have a spouse, your children, if you have children, would they say they see positive changes in your life? Are you more patient today or less patient than you were in the past? Or you're more, are you more kind or are you more cruel towards other people? Are you more authentic or more of a fake? Do you love more or love less than you used to? I mean, all of these are ways of asking, are you changing and growing in the right way? And for Ebenezer Scrooge, he was moving away from being an Ebenezer, a stone of help, and he was moving closer and closer to being a Scrooge, someone who really didn't care about other people, but only cared about himself. Well, the Christmas story is about transformation, of course, because in the end, we're gonna find Scrooge becomes Ebenezer once more. And in the sending of the ghosts, he is, uh, you know, we find, and ultimately I would say it's God who finds that he's trying to save or redeem this human being. Let me just remind you that the point of the Christmas story is redemption. Jesus came to save us, to deliver us, to rescue us. He was born a baby in Bethlehem, and that's the beginning of the story of his redemptive work in the world. And of course, we know one day he would be crucified, dead and buried, and on the third day rose from the grave, and all of that too, and everything in between, his teachings, his life, his ministry, is all about redemption. It's about transformation. It's about changing us. I want you to remember his Hebrew name, Yeshua, which in Greek is Jesus, which we translate as Jesus, means God saves or the Lord saves because he would save his people from their sins, the angel told Joseph in the dream. Now this is captured, this idea of Christmas being about our salvation, our transformation, our redemption is captured in a great old Christmas carol. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Christmas is about redemption. It's about forgiveness. It's about a new beginning. It's about transformation of our lives. And a Christmas carol reminds us that nobody is beyond redemption. And so the latest version of the, of the Christmas Carol was one that came out this year with Will Ferrell called Spirited. And there's one man who is the Ebenezer Scrooge of that film and his file is marked unredeemable. And yet Will Ferrell is really clear. There's nobody that's beyond redemption. And that's what the Christmas Carol tells us. That's what the Christmas story tells us. 
And so we find no one, not even nasty, mean, miserly Scrooge is beyond redemption. And that includes you. And it includes me. That leads us to the ghost of Christmas present. Now, uh, the ghost of Christmas present shows up and is gonna take uh, Ebenezer Scrooge to the town, to the homes of the, of the townspeople and particular people that knew Scrooge well. And he wants Ebenezer to hear what people are saying about him. Now, people shouldn't talk about one another, but in this case, you know, they're, they're you know, reciting in essence what Ebenezer Scrooge had been saying to people all along. He was unwilling to help other people. He was un- unwilling to give to charity. He didn't want, uh, he didn't want uh, Bob Crackett, Cratchit, his, his assistant, his clerk, to have the day off on Christmas Day even. He resented having to give him a free day off, you know, a paid day off for Christmas Day. I mean, this is what people are talking about. And so the ghost of Christmas present takes Ebenezer Scrooge to these various homes. Nobody can see him, but he can hear them and see them. And what he hears, he doesn't like. He doesn't like what people are saying about him. He doesn't like being that person. There's, all, you know, there's something happening in him that is saying, you've got to change, man. You've got to change. And, and sometimes it's helpful for us to know, you know, what is it that, you know, what impression are we making? What is it that people see in us you know, what they, what they wouldn't tell us face to face, but what they're actually feel, feeling or experiencing from us in our daily lives. So this is what begins to happen is he begins to see this and he begins to realize something needs to change. But it's really when, he, when he's taken to Bob Cratchit's house, his clerk's house, that he begins to understand just how onerous he had been, what a scrooge he had been. He arrives there and the angel takes him there, and uh, the ghost, excuse me, the messenger of God takes him there. And, uh, and he's looking at, he's kind of peering down, nobody can see him. And he sees how poor the Cratchit family is and how little they have. And then he sees uh, Tiny Tim. And Tiny Tim is, is, uh, is in need of medical care. He's, he's seriously ill and he's gonna die without medical treatment, but they don't have the money to be able to afford the kind of medical treatment that could save him. And so Ebenezer Scrooge is looking down over this family. He sees what's happening there. He hears the words that are spoken and he begins to feel convicted, guilty, and ashamed. Take a look at this clip from the 1999 film, uh, Christmas Carol. It's an it's a, uh, animated film, and Jim Carrey is the voice of Ebenezer Scrooge. Take a look. To Mr. Scrooge, the founder of our feast. Ha! Founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, you children. It's Christmas Day. Yeah, Christmas Day, I'm sure. How can one drink the health of such an odious, stingy, odd, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge? You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the day's not for his. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us. Everyone. <laughs> Merry Christmas. God bless. Merry Christmas. Kind spirit. Say Tiny Tim will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Die? No, spirit. No. Suddenly, Ebenezer Scrooge is seeing what he hadn't seen before, what he hadn't let himself see. One of his, one of his statements to people who were raising money for charity is he would say, you know, are there not debtors' prisons for them? Are there not places where they can go and work off their debt, no matter how harshly they'll be treated? Why, and some had said, well, people would rather die than go to some of these horrible places. And he said, well, then let them die, because that just reduces the surplus human population. That was his philosophy, but now he sees Tiny Tim. And he understands that he's been the cause. This is a working poor family and he's been the cause of their poverty by not paying a fair and living wage. And now he's finding his heart moved. This heart of stone is becoming a heart of flesh. He's beginning to change as he sees this. He's feeling guilt and shame and that's gonna lead him towards repentance. And that's part of what Christmas was about too. God came to us in the midst of poverty, right? You may remember that Jesus was born in the first century equivalent of a parking garage. He was born in in a stable, which was typically in Bethlehem, underground in a cave. And it's where people brought their donkeys and their animals in at night. And that's where Jesus was born because there was no room for him anywhere else. And he was born among the dung and and the animals and the straw. And he came in poverty. And as he grew up to be a man, he focused on this idea of being concerned for people who were less fortunate. This is one of the things he focused on and people who were broken and people were hurting and people were cast aside and treated as second class. And Jesus cared about all of those folks. And you may remember his very first sermon in Nazareth, where he grew up, 
It started with these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's quoting Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, right? And later on, he would say at the last judgment, we're gonna be judged by how we treated the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the in prison, the, the strangers in our midst. He's in this story, Charles Dickens is capturing a bit of what Jesus said really mattered and how we're meant to live our lives. You remember Mary, after she discovered that she was with child, said this uh, to Elizabeth. He, she sang these words, God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Ebenezer Scrooge is beginning to change. And as he begins to change, we recognize that we can change too. And that there's, there's an opening of our eyes, an opening of our heart, our heart begins to change. And what we find is when we become more generous, kind, loving, compassionate, merciful, just, we find we experience joy, more joy than we've ever experienced before when this becomes a part of the rhythm of our lives. That leads us to the ghost of Christmas future. So Ebenezer Scrooge is, uh, is now awakened once more on that Christmas Eve night. He is taken to a cemetery. Now, actually, before he gets to the cemetery, he is taken to listen in conversations around town, and it appears that somebody has died in the future. This somebody who has died is somebody that the townspeople don't seem to care much about. Even some of them despise him. And he's listening to people talk about this dead person, and he's wondering, who is this dead person? Who is this man who was, who was, uh, who was just unkind and uncharitable who has died? And, and, and he hears them talking about what they might be able to take from his body, the, the, the buttons on his shirt and, and these kinds of things. They, they begin to uh, listen to the people who want to take whatever he has of value, and they wonder what's going to happen with all of his wealth since he really never had any friends or any people that he cared about. And, and eventually he's taken to the room where this man is lying underneath a sheet, and he's afraid to pull back the sheet because he thinks he knows who's, who's underneath it. And of course, you guessed who it is. Now it's captured in this scene, and I wanna show you this clip from the 1901 version of A Christmas Carol. It was the first Christmas Carol ever put to film. The entire film was only four minutes long, and, uh, and it was a silent film, of course. But I want you to have a chance to see just this scene from the film, take a look. Ebenezer Scrooge has son seen the future and he's seen and stared his own mortality in the, in the face. He has come to realize that that man they were talking about is him. And it made me remember when I was thinking about this, this particular clip or this scene, made me, me remember a funeral I was called to do a number of years ago. The funeral home called and said, Pastor Adam, is there any way you could do this funeral for this person? And I said, well, of course, I'm happy to do it. They said, tell me their story. And, and the funeral director said, I really don't know very much of the story. I said, well, well, how do I reach the family so I can spend time with them? And, and he said, they don't want to talk to anybody and they don't plan to be at the funeral. And I said, Really? And he said, yeah, that nobody, as far as we know, nobody's gonna be there. We're not sure. Maybe there'll be somebody show up. It's, it's in the newspaper and the obituaries. Maybe someone will be there. They don't wanna have a, a funeral indoors uh, at a church or at the funeral home. We're just gonna do a short graveside service. Would you be willing to do this? And I've done over 300 funerals. This was the only funeral I've ever done where there was nobody else there. There was the uh, funeral director, funeral home director who was there. Uh, there was somebody back by the backhoe who was ready to finish the placement of the, of the casket in the ground. And not a friend, not a family member, not a coworker, not a soul who showed up for that funeral. And of course, our aim was to commit this person to God's love and care and to God's grace. And we didn't know their story, but, but we did pray for them and ask for God to care for them. And we celebrated life. And we recognized that in the midst of the, well, a life that seemed to be characterized by Ebenezer Scrooge, that despite the Scrooge nature of this person that led people not to want to show up and not to care, that there was an Ebenezer inside even this person. And so we gave them to God, not knowing what response God would have to this person or what they'd done. And then I contrasted that in my mind with all of the funerals I've done for people who came together to celebrate, for, for families when I've sat in living rooms with grandchildren and children and, and spouses, and they talked with such love about their, about their mate or about their grandpa or grandma or about their, their, uh, their dad or mom. And as I've thought about that, you know, I would take copious notes and that then forms the basis for the eulogy and the homily and the, in the, in the memorial service. But I've thought, I don't think I can remember a single time when somebody said, you know, what was awesome about my dad was how much money he had saved up in the bank. I've never heard anybody say that. Never heard anybody say, you know, what was great about mom was she was a, she was a go-getter and, and she was, you know, constantly climbing the corporate ladder and she made it all the way up to this executive level. I've never heard anybody 
say, that's what I think was really awesome about my mom or my dad or my sister or my brother or my friend or coworker. You know what they talk about when we're sitting down and they want to tell me the good things about their, their loved one? They tell me acts of kindness that they had done for other people. They, they tell me how considerate they were. They tell me how they, how they served other people. They told me about servant leadership or they told me about, about compassion or mercy or, or all the ways they love their family, even more than their job and what they sacrificed in order to be there at ball games or in order to be there for special events or, or how they were always there at just the right time to show care and love. They were Ebenezer's. I never heard about Scrooge. And so when, when uh, Ebenezer Scrooge comes to grips with his own death, face-to-face -face with his own mortality, part of what he's asking is the same kind of questions that we ask. How will people remember me? What's the legacy that I leave behind? What difference will I have made? And what's gonna become of me when I'm gone? So when I think about this, I think about the promise that we have in Jesus. I wanna remind you that Christmas is not just about the birth of Jesus. It really is about, it's celebrating everything that happens in his life. It starts with his birth, but it's gonna celebrate his life, his teachings, it's his compassion and concern for people who are broken or hurting or, or, or struggling in whatever way. His way of reaching out to people who had been made to feel like they were second class, all of this, the way he fed the multitudes, all of it. This is what we're celebrating, but we're not only celebrating that, we're celebrating his suffering and death on the cross, which Christians believe was a picture of the divine love for us, of God's love for us and God's redemptive work and his paying a price to redeem us and set us free of our debts and a thousand other things that the cross means. But at Christmas, we celebrate that too. His forgiveness and grace. And finally, we celebrate his resurrection, the hope that we have in Christ, that death has been defeated by Jesus at Easter and that death is not the end of the story and that the worst thing isn't the last thing as we often say around here and that there is always hope. At Christmas time, many of us have lost loved ones in the last year. And, and I think, you know, Christmas, it seems like it's gonna be really hard when we come for our first Christmas without our loved one. But here's the thing, if we think about it just right, we realize that Christmas is God's way of saying that in the end, death doesn't win. And our mortality isn't the last word. And that our loved ones are with Christ in heaven. And so we celebrate at Christmas. And this is what we capture in, in this beloved Christmas carol. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Peace, peace. Jesus Christ was born to slay, save, calls you, calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save, Christ was born to save. Jesus said it this way, I am the resurrection and the life and those who believe in me will never die. That night, Ebenezer Scrooge had a change of heart. He saw what was broken in his past and the pain that he'd inflicted on himself by becoming Scrooge, putting money ahead of everything else. He had the opportunity to see people that he, that he came to care about, how, how his own stinginess and miserliness had brought pain to other people. And then he had a chance to stare death in its face and to realize something's got to change. And he cries out, you know, at, at one point he cries out to that angel uh, or to the ghost. And he says, I promise I have changed. I will not be the same man that I was in the past. I will be a different man from this time forward. Please, please save me, rescue me. So that leads to what happens on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, Ebenezer Scrooge truly repented. And to repent, the Greek word is metanoia. It means to have a change of mind, to think differently. And that leads to a change of heart, which leads to a change of behavior. And when you've done all three of those things, the man who had strayed away into becoming Scrooge had come back to becoming Ebenezer. From one who crushes others to one who is a stone of help. All right. We talk about this in scripture as being born anew or born again. And he was born again that day and everything began to change. And, and it's interesting, every great Christmas story is a redemption story. So I think about the green furry monster called the Grinch. And you remember what happens on Christmas day? His heart grew three sizes that day. I just wonder what needs to change in you? Have you ever repented? Have you ever come to a place where you realize I strayed from the path and I need to come back and I don't like who I've been and I wanna be who God wants me to be. I wanna be an Ebenezer and not a Scrooge. Well, from that time on, Ebenezer took great joy in being generous and caring for people and celebrating Christmas all year long. And it's captured <clears throat> in this beautiful clip and this song from the Muppet Christmas Carol. Take a listen. A gift for me. Thank you. Thank you. Fifty times, and a Merry Christmas. Here's your turkey, Mr. Scrooge. Follow me, lad. With 
a thankful heart, with an endless joy, with a growing family, every girl and boy will be nephew and niece to me. Nephew and niece to me. Will bring love, hope and peace to me. Love, hope and peace to me. Yes, and every night will end, and every day will start with a grateful prayer and a thankful heart. I love that song. And I love the spirit and the joy and the ability to sing again. He who is bitter and miserly has found joy. And that's why at the end of every candlelight Christmas Eve service, we come to the very end and the last song we sing after we've lit the candles and sung Silent Night is Joy to the World. Because that's what Christmas brings to us when we find the redemptive work of Jesus at work in our lives, when his light has flooded and permeated our darkness, when we've been transformed, what we find is joy. That leads me to one last story. I think about the story of Christmas as a gift from God. It, it, the whole thing, Jesus coming, the whole, all the story, everything that happens in Jesus' life, a gift from God. And I was reminded recently of a story uh, by, of one of our members, uh, one of our staff members. Her name is Mindy LaHood. And Mindy, years ago, was a teacher. Before she began to work at our church, she'd been a teacher. She was a teacher in Peoria, Illinois. It was a school, a middle school, in which most of the children are on the free or reduced lunch program. And she'd gone there to teach literature, seventh and eighth grade literature. And she said when she got to school, part of what she realized is before she could teach literature, she had to demonstrate to these kids that she cared about them. There were many who hadn't experienced care or love in their homes. There's a lot of pain in that school. And so, so she had to win them over. And so part of what she did was she tried to show them love. What she knew is what you've heard before, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that semester, that first semester, constantly working to show love for these kids, to be their stone of help, to be their Ebenezer, their helper. And she described what happened at Christmas time that year when, when the school was taking its Christmas break. And she said uh, she was packing things up for the Christmas holiday when one young child, a 13 year old girl walked into the room and she carried forward a package wrapped for her teacher. And she brought it to Mindy's desk and, and she looked at Mindy and she said, please open it, please open it. And so Mindy opened the gift and she said inside was a torn and tattered and faded t-shirt. There were holes around the, around the neck and this young woman, this young girl said, this is my favorite teacher, uh, my favorite t-shirt, my favorite t-shirt, Miss Mindy. And the girl was crying as she was handing her this gift. And, and Mindy said she took the gift and she started crying. And she realized how much this meant. This was her prized possession. And she was giving it as a way of saying, I see that you saw me. You cared about me. You loved me. And Mindy said, I wanted to give her a t-shirt back. I didn't want to take her prized possession. And then I realized I needed to take her prized possession. I needed her to know how much I appreciated her appreciation and her expression of love with the, with the thing that was most valuable in her life. And it got me thinking about what God has done for us in Jesus. So God didn't send three ghosts to redeem us. And he didn't give us an old tattered t-shirt. He gave us his son. He gave us Jesus to show us the depth of his love, to bring about a change in our hearts as we begin to follow him and to show us what it means to be human, what it means to be an Ebenezer. All right, I wanna wrap this up by simply saying that we now are preparing to receive our Christmas Eve candlelight offering. I want you to know just a little bit about that. At Christmas Eve, we give away the entire Christmas Eve offering. So wherever you are, TV, online, if you're watching from one of our other locations, we give away the entire offering. We don't keep any of it. It's not your, this service is a gift to you. And as we prepare to give it away, what we look for are our causes, projects, we look for partners, we look for agencies and organizations that are working with uh, low-income children and their families. And, and so as we do that, we split half the money, half of it stays in the Kansas City area, half of it goes internationally. This year, we have 26 different projects that we are supporting with these funds. Last year, on Christmas Eve, you gave $2.5 million across all of our locations on TV and online. $2.5 million. Many of our Resurrection members have made a commitment to give an amount equal to what they spend on their own families at Christmas for children living in poverty who have no one to help, to be a stone of help, to be an Ebenezer. And what I found in my life, what my wife and I have found is we have so much joy in giving to this project and knowing that there are children whose lives are being affected by this. I wanted you to have a chance to see. So half is going internationally to in the poorest countries in the world, half in Kansas City to low-income children and their families. I wanted you to see just two of the 26 projects. Take a look. Zoe is a three-year program where they take children that have absolutely nothing and not only 
give them an opportunity to have a job, have secure housing, education, hygiene, teach them child rights. But they give them, and this is actually the most important part, they give them hope. So Zoe goes in and identifies children that are the most vulnerable, the ones that may have no parents, they have no home, they have no food, and those are the children they invite to this program. When they first start in the program their very first year, they won't look at you, they look down, they're shamed, they have no hope. But when you then meet children that are either graduating from the program, so they're in their third year or they're a graduate, it's incredible the difference. So this Candlelight Christmas Eve, we have an opportunity to do this with 400 more children in Malawi, and we're gonna expand into a new partnership into Uganda. So our mission is to provide a safe, nurturing educational environment for children in poverty and to empower their parents through emergency aid, assistance, advocacy, and education. Sometimes we see that our children will have much higher percentages of, of simple things like experience with violence inside or outside the home, incarceration of a parent, loss of a parent. Many of our families are working, yet average income is only about $12,000 per year. Most of the families are single parent households, yet they're some of the most resilient families that I know. Um, they're oftentimes working through difficult choices. It's not as simple as can I provide food or housing. We have 405 children in our early care and preschool programming, and then as they enter kindergarten, they can move into our before and after school program where we're serving another 250 to 300 children. And basically when school's out, we're in. It keeps parents working, but it makes sure kids have what they need um, to succeed. We are so grateful for everyone who's participating in the Christmas Eve candlelight services because those gifts are gonna change lives. So here's the thing. We may all have a bit of Scrooge in us, but we also have a bit of Ebenezer in us. And the question is, which will you be? The stone of help or the one who crushes? And I know the answer. We all wanna be the stone of help. So I wanna invite you this Christmas to be able to say yes to Jesus, to be able to say yes to his love and grace and mercy, and to be a stone of help for someone else. So in a moment, we're gonna receive the offering, but right now, I'd like for you to bow in prayer with me, and I'd love for you to whisper this prayer under your breath to God. God, thank you for everything. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for coming to us in Jesus. Thank you. Transform my heart. Make me the person you want me to be. And Jesus, help me to follow you. In your holy name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again for live worship online or in person. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.